but has there been enough time for the evolution of the eye? Well, recently a Swedish scientist called Dan Nielsen has tried to answer that question. He did pretty much the same as we've just been doing here, but he did it with a computer. So instead of growing up in big steps, as we had to do with our wooden model, he was able to do it in very small steps on his computer. In fact, very small steps indeed, deliberately. He assumed that each step, which means each mutation, caused only a 1% change in the size of something, like, say, the steepness of a cup. He also devised a way of measuring the efficiency of an eye. He did this by telling the computer to measure various things about the eye that it had just drawn itself. And then the computer worked out, using the rules of physics, how good an image that eye would be capable of producing. And the question was, with those rules built into it, would there be a smooth gradient of improvement, starting out with a flat retina and ending with a proper eye like ours? And you've guessed it, the answer is yes. This was Nielsen's starting point with just a flat retina <laughs> under a flat transparent layer. And now let's just run the simulation of, these are the successive stages that Nielsen got, and they're pretty similar to the successive stages that Bryson got with his model. So, so far we haven't learned anything that we didn't already know. There is a smooth progression, upbound improbable, for the eye. But Nielsen went on to estimate how many generations it would take to accomplish this evolution. In order to do this, he had to make some more detailed assumptions. I won't bother you with exactly what they were. All you need know is that they were quantities which geneticists out in the field can measure and have measured. And Nielsen put into his computer model values of these quantities that were conservative. Conservative means that he was erring on the side of deliberately biasing his calculation to, to make it slow, to give it an estimate on the slow side of evolution. Make evolution come out slower than it might otherwise have done. But in spite of this, in spite of his being conservative, and in spite of assuming that each mutation could only cause a 1% change, which is another conservative assumption, Nielsen found that the evolution of the eye, we've just seen, would take a surprisingly short time. It would take about 250,000 generations. Well, that might sound like quite a lot of generations, but we have a rather warped perspective, because after all, each one of us is only good for one generation. But our human perspective is not the one that matters. The one that matters is the geological timescale. And on the geological timescale, 250,000 generations is next to nothing. Probably only about a quarter of a million years, since the animals we're talking about will probably have had a generation time of about a year. And a quarter of a million years is really too short for geologists to even measure. It's like trying to count seconds using the hour hand of your watch. So there really was no need for Darwin to shudder. Half an eye is better than no eye. Half an eye is better than 49% of an eye. 1% of an eye is better than no eye at all. And far from there not being enough time for the evolution of the eye, the evolution of the eye is so quick and easy that it must have happened many, many times over. Eyes can evolve at the drop of a hat. And in fact, if we look around the animal kingdom, there are lots of different kinds of eyes dotted around, and each of them is different. Many of them work on completely different principles, and they have evolved quite independently of each other, many times over. This is the shell of a scallop, a kind of shellfish. These things are not pearls, they're eyes. <coughs> But they're a very different kind of eye from anything we've seen and anything that we normally think about. Those eyes are reflector eyes. They have mirrors instead of lenses. Each one of these is a little curved mirror which works like the Jodrell Bank telescope and forms an image in the way that a reflecting telescope does, not in the way that our eyes do. Uh, this is a compound eye of an insect. Each one of these little facets is one little eye, and the whole assembly together 
is interpreted by the brain to make one big image. Next eye, next one. These headlights belong to a spider. Once again, this is entirely independent evolution of the eye. It's nothing to do with the other eyes that we've seen. And next, and finally the eye of a squid. Uh, this is the skin of a squid. There's its eye. The squid has a very excellent eye, very like ours, with a proper lens, proper camera principle. But you can tell by looking at the details of it, especially how it develops, that it evolved entirely independently of ours. The same principle was hit on entirely independently of ours. Once again, remember that each step is a small piece of random luck. As such, each step is not particularly impressive. In fact, it had better not be impressive, because if it was, it would be a miracle, and we'd no longer have a true explanation. The whole point of evolution is that it gets us up Mount Improbable without miracles.